soon and very soon we are going to see the king soon and very soon we are going to see the king hallelujah hallelujah we're going to see the king no more crying there we are going to see the king hallelujah no more crying there we are going to see the king hallelujah no more crying there we are going to see the king hallelujah hallelujah we're going to see the king no more dying there we are going to see the king hallelujah no more dying there we are going to see the king hallelujah no more dying there we are going to see the king hallelujah hallelujah we're going to see the king i'm happy today oh yes i'm happy today in jesus christ i'm happy today because he's taken all my sins away and that's why i'm happy today I'm singing today, oh yes, I'm singing today, in Jesus Christ. I'm singing today because he's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm singing today. I'm praying today, oh yes, I'm praying today, in Jesus Christ. I'm praying today because he's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm praying today. I'm happy today, oh yes, I'm singing today, in Jesus Christ. I'm praying today because he's taken all my sins away, and that's why I'm sharing today. Walking on heaven's road, I'm gonna lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Who's that walking down the road, carrying such a heavy load? Sinner, lay your burden down, cause we're walking on heaven's road. Walking on heaven's road, I'm gonna lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Young folks walking hand in hand, singing with the angel band. Old folk ain't so tired no more, cause, cause we're walking on, on heaven's road. road. Walking on heaven's road, I'm gonna lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Ain't no tears, no crying there, ain't no sadness anywhere. Ain't got time to shed no tears, cause I'm walking on heaven's road. Walking on heaven's road, I'm gonna lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? I am I no more. I am I. Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my Lord, and he rules my life. Jesus is my Lord, he will come again, he will come again, and he'll take
Come, let us sing with joy to the Lord, let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him, the sea is his, he made it. And his hands they formed the dry land, and his hands they formed the dry Dry land. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see everyone again uh, here with us today for our worship here at Central. I also like to welcome our folks that are watching on our live stream or our other media coverages. But we would like to welcome you to come and be with us anytime that you can. Uh, in our auditorium. We have a lot of announcements this morning, so I'm going to try to go through them as hurriedly uh, as I can. Uh, a lot of them are on the back of the uh, bulletin, but uh, let's go over them here together. Uh, first of all, we do have uh, Sunday night service here tonight. It'll be a regular uh, traditional service, and it'll be here at 6 uh, p.m. We have a lot of uh, special days, uh, birthdays coming up. Uh, 422, we have Daniel Czar, and then we have three on the 23rd. We have Edith Camp, Debbie Foster, and Mary Lackford. So we wish those ladies and uh, Daniel a happy birthday, as well as on the 25th, James Tubb, and then the uh, 27th is Caitlin Young. So we'd like to wish those folks a happy birthday as well. We have one anniversary, and I think I probably need to make this announcement so John will remember, but he and uh, April Smith, uh, John and April Smith, have an anniversary coming up on the 24th. Uh, just a reminder about our April Bible reading. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you are, are participating in that, and uh, we would uh, encourage everyone to do so. Uh, this week, the 25th, prime time will be going to Oakland's uh, mansion in Murfreesboro. Be living at 9.30. The cost of the tour is $10. Also looking forward to the next uh, week. Uh, next Sunday, we have the First Steps graduation program. That will be on the 28th. Uh, May 5th, another special day coming up for us. We have Friends and Family Day, which we're calling Spring Bring. And uh, invite your friends and family, and then we'll have a fellowship meal after service. And there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer for food, and there's also a sign-up sheet to help with uh, in the kitchen and cleanup. And uh, that's a very important part of our, our dinners. Uh, a lot of times some of the uh, ladies end up uh, having to do a whole lot of it. So if you can... Please sign up to help clean up uh, next week. Uh, sign up sheet for the VBS planning committee is in the foyer. That meeting then will be tonight. If you've signed up or you have an interest in helping with VBS, that will be uh, today at 5 p.m. And then we have parents, pancakes, and pajamas will be May 4th. So a lot going on here at Central. And uh, remember, on the spring bring, uh, on uh, May 5th. Also, we have a couple of uh, announcements that uh, we need to make this morning. Uh, we need some help. And uh, today, if you can stay after morning services to help get everything out of the annex, uh, the floor will be uh, cleaned and uh, uh, waxed this week. And uh, we're gonna start that tomorrow. So if you can stay after service to go over and help with the tables and chairs, that would be appreciated. Also, we have an, another uh, asked for help, and that's going to be Saturday, April 27th, and we're going to declutter the church. Uh, we will be uh, going through various parts of the building and removing or repurposing items in the building that have exceeded their purpose. And if you could uh, share some time this coming Saturday, please meet at the building at 10 o'clock. And this is open to anyone who could share a few minutes to help with this cleanup effort. 
and everyone is welcome to do that, men, women, children, whoever can help. So at this time, we'll ask Tommy if he'll come off for our first prayer. Let us pray. God, our Father, as we approach your throne of grace this morning, we do so cognizant of your omnipotent power, Father, the greatness, goodness, and holiness of your name. Father, we're so thankful for every blessing that you give us each and every day, and none more, Father, than the gift of your Son that you sent to this earth to die a cruel death, that we would have hope and promise of eternal life with you. Father, we're thankful that we can just come together and call ourselves your children. We ask that you bless our elders here. Father, we ask that you guide them and direct them as they lead us. Father, we know that there are those here this morning, those listening online, that are dealing with illness, sadness, bereavement, and heartbreak for a myriad of reasons. Father, we, we don't know each name. We certainly don't know the circumstances. But Father, through your omniscience, you know each one by name and each set of circumstances in detail. We ask, Father, that you give them the healing and the comfort that can come only from you. Father, we thank you for James and his family and the work they do here at Central. We ask that you be with him this morning as he brings us a message from your word. And Father, we pray that as we leave here that we can take the good news of your word and share it with our community and the world and bring the lost to Christ. Father, as we continue this morning, we ask that everything that we think, do, and say be in accordance with your will and pleasing in your sight. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Our first song this morning is Not in the Book, Shout to the Lord. Will you please stand for this song? My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. 
Shout to the Lord all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. You may be seated. At this time, we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, singing Jesus is Lord, number 180. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how he loves me, how I love him, he is risen, he is coming, Lord come quick. sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Am I worth it? This is a question that we ask ourselves as we walk through this life walking with Jesus. Um, are we worth the sacrifice and the blood that was shed for us? Uh, well, I'm here to tell you that we are worth it and God thinks that we are worth it. Um, now, we're not the only ones who wrestle with this or have wrestled with this. Uh, I'd like to look back to Exodus the story of Moses whenever he came upon the burning bush. Um, Moses comes upon the burning bush, and <clears throat> there is where God told him that he would be the one that would go to Pharaoh and lead his people out of, out of Egypt. And, you know, when he said that, did Moses stand up and say, hey, I'm the guy for the job. You've picked the right one. No. The first thing that entered Moses' mind was doubt. Uh, and we're told that in Exodus 3. The first words that came out of his mouth was, Who am I? Who am I to lead your people out of Egypt? <clears throat> well, then God gave him those comforting words. In the very next verse, God tells him, I will be with you. So we always have to remember that, that God is with us. So as we're dealing and wrestling with those same thoughts as, as Moses, uh, let us think of the words of Jesus. <clears throat> so in the book of Matthew, 
right after Jesus had healed the, the paralyzed man, he went and met with Matthew and goes to Matthew's house to have a meal. So the Pharisees and the disciples walk upon it, and the first thing the Pharisees say to the disciples is, who is this man that eats with the publicans and sinners? Jesus overhears it, and his exact words, he, he says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Also, let us remember what Paul wrote to, the, to those at Ephesus. In Ephesus 2.13, But now in Christ, you whom were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So let us always remember that if God is with us, we are worthy, and God thinks we're worthy. Just as Moses, as when we, think, when we start to think that we're not worthy, just remember that God is with us, and let us also remember what Jesus said in Matthew 9, that he came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your Son and that great sacrifice that you were willing to, to give for us on the cross. Father, as we take this bread, let us do it in a way that would be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let us pray for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this cup and for the blood that was shed for our sins. Be with us as we take it and help us to concentrate on the blood that was shed for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, separate from the Lord's Supper, we also have the opportunity to give back a portion of, of what has been what we have been blessed with. Uh, there's many different ways you can give. There's boxes back in the foyer. You can drop it, drop it in. You can give it to one of the elders. Uh, you can go online and give. But a as we prepare to do that, let's let us pray. Father, we're so thankful to live in a place where we have the ability to to earn a living. Father, we pray that as we're preparing to give a portion back to you that we will give with a cheerful heart father we also pray that what we give will will be used wisely and go to help further your kingdom in christ's name we pray amen Next song will be Shout Hallelujah. This might be a little bit of a newer song, but uh, we'll, si we'll be singing the chorus, the first verse, the chorus, the first verse, and the chorus again, so I'll, we'll pick up on it pretty quick. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make it joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God.
God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Amen. If you're using a book and like to mark our song invitation, be number 469, 469, Faith is the Victory. Then if you'll please stand for our next song and remain standing for the scripture reading afterwards, it'll be at the name of Jesus. This is one that we learned a couple of Wednesdays back. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee Every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow at his name. There is no other name, no name by which we're saved. There is no other name but Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. At the knee shall at his name every knee shall bow at his name our scripture reading today will be coming from Joshua chapter 6 verses 3 through 5 Joshua chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for six days, with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seventh time, seven times. The priests blowing the trumpets, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people shall charge straight ahead. You may be seated. Thank you, Daniel, for that good reading. Thank you for uh, being here today. To all who are here, so I'm going to say good morning. Good morning. Hope that you are excited to be here. I know yesterday the ladies had a blessing of uh, being able to have you know the event together yesterday morning, um, focusing on fellowship and painting, focusing on art. I know we have apparently several really good artists who are here today, and if you enjoyed that, we're glad that you uh, have that good memory. Uh, we are looking forward to May the 5th, which will be about two weeks, two weeks from this morning. That is our Friends and Family Day, so please be sure that you are making uh, preparations not only to be here yourself, but to do what you can to allow others the blessing 
of being at the Central Congregation. That's really what we're trying to do. And we talked a little bit about that this morning in Bible class with regards to discipleship. Our focus should be the focus of our, of our teacher. And Jesus was the most focused person who has ever existed, and his focus stayed and remained the same from his ministry to the center of the ministry to his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. We have a job to do today. We want to plant the good seed and allow that to find fertile ground and hearts to grow closer to God. So let's do what we can. I'll say a little bit more about that after our sermon today. Um, I want to share with you a couple of, of great points. I am always overjoyed, really. It's, it's overjoyous, really, uh, to hear from friends of mine throughout the you know, world, particularly in mission points that I've been involved in. And uh, it seemed like just back to back, I received something from Athens, Greece, where they had just baptized a young lady in the Christ Jesus. And Brother Benny Laka, um, who is part of the work there, uh, shared with me the email. And then uh, Peter, who is one of the associates there in Athens, Greece, shared with me the same news. And so I was like, okay, this is a wonderful thing when in that, in that government there is a child of God that comes from that kind of uh, that kind of environment so it wasn't hop skipping and jump later until I heard from my friend Mark Charles down in St. Vincent and just yesterday um, he baptized two people into Christ Jesus and so in just a weekend or so we I, I heard uh, of the blessing of three uh, precious souls that have uh, been added to the Lord's church today so we're glad for that, and I hope that you will rejoice in those things. And let's do what we can to allow that uh, rejoicing to, to, to pour over into the work here at Central. All right. So I decided, instead of us staying in the book of Joshua for the next you know, few weeks, I'm going I'm to do one more lesson from the series on the footsteps of faith. But we're going to do it next week in the book of Acts. So we're going to jump from the Old Testament into uh, New Testament uh, concepts. So we will have a kind of shift of attention then. But today, I want you to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5 and Joshua chapter 6. We're talking about footsteps of faith. How that when you follow the leadership of God you know it's always going to be okay. But you will have your moments when you wonder how it's possible. We started last week with looking at the idea of, of Israel crossing the Jordan River, having to trust God in that. And we're going to hold on to that very same element today in trusting God in this. Because now we're coming into a, a separate sort of, of issue. Now we have, as Israel, as we follow this narrative, Israel has crossed the Jordan River. They are in Canaan, and everything is just the way it needs to be. But it's, it's during this time that the problems start to creep up. People start to wonder how are things going to work out the way that we know they are. If you notice on the slide that I have behind me and in front of you, it is that when you're facing walls and you do so by faith in God and you know that those walls are merely obstructions to the path that God has in mind in the end, then we know the walls are going to come down. But it doesn't take away from the fact that we wonder, how's God going to work this out this particular time? And that's when we go into our, our lesson today. The problem for Israel is that even though they're in Canaan and they can look around and see the, the great trees and the, green, you know, the greenery and, and, the, and the, the, the beautiful streams of waters and the plush, fertile environments, things are looking good. The problem is they're coming upon now the first level of enemies. Those enemies have been hearing about this for a long time. They're getting ready. And the problem is that on the inside of Canaan, you've got these warriors, fortified warriors, ready to go, ready to attack. And they do not take kindly to the idea that this Hebrew nation out there has been mulling around for the last 40 years and they've got us in their crosshairs. That's, that's not something that sets well with these individuals. And so as they face Canaan, they're also facing cities with fortified walls. 
And the people on the inside have armor, and they have chariots, and they got battle horses, they've got swords, and they've got axes, they've got all kinds of you know, weaponry. For the last 40 years, they've been basing going into Canaan on a ruling of a minority of people. But the majority of people, the majority of those spies that went in 40 years before, is still resonating with the people of God right now. And that is, 10 of the 12 spies came back and said, look, this land looks amazing. It looks great. But we can't. Can't take it. It's not going to work. At least, not for us. What you have to recognize right here is that for the last 430 years... Israel has not been like the Canaanites. This generation can look back at their fathers and their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers and say in every generation going backwards, we're not warriors. We're not soldiers. We're not bred for that. We have been in captivity. We've We've been slaves. And if you compared my skill with a weapon to the skill of those in those fortified walls, I've got nothing to offer. Things are not looking very good for me. And so as they're crossing the the, the river and as they walk into the land, there's one question that we ask too. If we project those ideas on this situation, we're thinking, how are they ever going to take this land? And that's what they were thinking too. At least 40 years ago, how could we ever take this land? And here's a question we've got right now. If you're reading this for the first time, you're thinking, how is Israel ever going to take this land? We're about to get the answer. Now, they are facing for the very first occasion, which is ironic, I guess, but they're facing for the very first occasion in the conquest the most fortified city of them all. So the biggest challenge is right now. It's right here. And it's the, uh, the ancient city of Jericho. Jericho's got some serious walls around them. Now, if you, uh, if you know anything about present time, you know that Jericho holds a distinction of being the oldest still-inhabited city in 2024 that's ever existed. You can go there now. People are still there as they always have been, the still-inhabited city of, of Jericho. And uh, what's interesting about it is, and this is from an archaeological, historical perspective, what happens back then is that if, um, if, a, if a warring faction or a separate sort of empire were to come in with a distinct culture, they would come into a particular city or area, and they would destroy it and then cover it up and then build on top of it over and over and over. So over the years of the history of Jericho, that's what you've had happen. Different cultures come in, and they build on it, and they build sometimes out from that base area so that it in time gets bigger than it originally was. So what that has enabled archaeologists to do is to go back through the layers and come up with some answers in terms of what the history of that particular place you know, happened to look like. And the bottom line is, Jericho was in that day and time known for, and is today known for the fact that they had these, these huge walls. And that makes sense if you're trying to protect the people on the inside. Uh, to your immediate left over there, that's what modern day ancient Jericho looked like. You can, you can look at that if you want. Hey, appreciate that. Is it on yet? All right, thank you. Do what? Thank you. All right, there we go. Oops, just a minute. All right. That's better on my voice. Maybe easier on your ears. I don't know. All right, so that's ancient Jericho right over there. And these are a couple of artistic renditions of the way it would have looked. And I know I've shared two of these uh, with you several weeks back when we talked about ancient Jericho as we study the book of Joshua. One of the interesting things about archaeological evidence is that were a city like Jericho to be attacked from the outside using you know, battering rams or some sort of tool to create a falling wall, 
the walls would have fallen toward the city, but archaeological evidence suggests that the walls, when they were breached, were breached by the walls falling outwardly. So something had to have happened with these walls. Now, the reason we're getting into all that is because here's what you've got going on in the context. You've got a bunch of scared, you ready? A bunch of scared slaves in a brand new environment, brand new land they don't belong in yet. And they have this impossible task of overpowering the most strongly fortified walled city in ancient Canaan. And this is what becomes known to us as the Battle of Jericho. This is where we are right now. Now, all of us in here know the story. I'm not going to go through it again. We will look at the text that Daniel read in just a minute one more time. But what does happen is that we overlook the foreshadowing that occurs in Joshua chapter 5. And I want you to look at that with me right now. Foreshadowing means the hint of what is yet to come. And that's exactly what we have happening right here in chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. So please, if you're there, read it with me so we'll know what's happening right here. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, look at this reply, right? No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So look at that, look at that part right there. Hey, hey, and Joshua comes out. I'm leading this show. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you for? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the reply, which I love, is no. You're like, what? Are you for us or for our enemies? No. Who he's for is the one who would turn their face in obedience to the Lord. That's who he's for. Joshua understands that, it seems like. Joshua bows his head before the commander of the army of the Lord. And now, it's at that point... God starts to share these details of just how Jericho will fall. Now, do you remember how it's going to fall? All of us do. Look at chapter 6 and listen to verses 3 through 5, okay? I'm going to kind of paraphrase it since we've heard it already. You're going to march around that city, all your men of war. You know. You'll go around the city one time, do that for six days. On the seventh day, you're going to march around it seven times, and then uh, the priests are going to blow their trumpets. And as soon as they blow their trumpets, the ram's horns, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people are going to shout with a great shout, and here's what's going to happen. All, the wall of the city is going to fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight before him. Now, here's your question today. James, you've given considerable time to setting this up. What on earth does this have to do with you and me? It's a really good question. Why would I spend this amount of time just to get us into that, that scene? And it's because we've all run onto some walled cities before, haven't we? In life? You ever gotten into a position where the deck of cards is stacked against you? The odds are against you. And you've got zero previous experience with anything like this. That's where Israel is right now. And you don't even know sometimes what to apply to this situation. So having said that, we're able to look at our, our points today. And that is, when you run against a wall in your own life, the very first thing i got to say is, is really pretty simple. It's, it's two words, and these words go together like peanut butter and jelly, like, <laughs> like pork and beans, or Batman and Robin. And you can pick whichever one you like more uh, in, that, in that list of those three options, okay? But these two words are faith and obedience. We might even use the words trust and obey, for there's no other way, right? So when we talk about these, these two words, you hit a wall in your life, and the very first thing you're going to say is, I'm going to obey God. That's it. 
I'm going to obey God. Got faith in God that He's going to get me across these walls. I'm going to obey Him, whatever it is He wants me to do. I'm going to obey God. Here it is. Now watch. No matter how difficult it may seem. And that's the hard part. And I'm going to tell you why that's the hard part. And here it is. If I'm honest with you and you're honest with yourself, obeying God is not always that easy. You ever thought that? It's not always easy. And you may say, oh, James, I can't believe you would say that. The commandments of God are not burdensome. John tells us that. Amen, he does. Absolutely he does. Let me say it this way. Obedience is not always easy, but obedience is always the best. Let me give you some examples here. It wasn't easy... The path wasn't easy for Elijah to go and confront Ahab and Jezebel. He's going to stand up before them and say, look, here's what God says. You have to understand, Elijah knows that Ahab has the resources to kill Elijah. It's not easy to walk into a position or a place like that. Not easy, but it's always best. It wasn't easy, and you may say, well, it's part of his spiritual nature. So, yes, this is true. Daniel can look in the face of a law that says no longer pray to God anymore, and Daniel keeps on praying anyway. And I might say that's not necessarily easy. And the reason I say that is because, not because Daniel's not committed, But because from a practical perspective, that could cause problems for Daniel. And by the way, it did. Obedience is not always easy. But obedience is the best. And probably the best one I was thought to use in this would be in Genesis 22, when God is testing Abraham about his very own son Isaac. Are you going to obey me, Abraham? Lord, I'm, I'm here to obey you. What do you want me to do? I want you to give me back the son I gave you, the son of promise. That's what I want. And you're looking at this right now, and you're thinking, okay, um, that's not so easy. We've always got to obey. Because it's best. And because this is God. But it's not always the easiest thing to do. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, oh, I, I cannot believe how much I disagree with you right now, James. When you learn to obey God, it is easy. Let me, let me just let me throw it into you in a very practical way. Okay? I'm going to drop something in your lap, and this is what proves my point. Okay? Here's what the Lord said to every one of us. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. And here's here's your second one to drop in your lap, okay? Love your neighbor the way you love yourself. Either of those always easy? But the God who commands that is the God that knows what's best for us. So you understand, you know, kind of the way I'm, I'm working with this. And you might be sitting there going, wow, wow. But you see, there's another layer to it, and that's really what we have over here on the the second place. The, The idea is we obey God even when it makes no sense. In fact, obey God when it makes very little sense. That's on your, on your handout that you're supposed to be you know, filling out if you want to. It's not hard. It's not hard for Israel right now to march around the city wall, right? That's not hard. Do it once a day. We got this. No problem. It's not hard to do that. It's not much work really to do that. But it's also not much of a battle plan either. That's what everybody always talks about, right? The Battle of Jericho was based on what people would say is military nonsense. There's no strategy behind any of this right now. The battle plan is completely unexpected, just like 2 Kings 5, when Naaman is told to go and wash himself in the River Jordan seven times, and then he's going to be, then he's going to be cleansed. Now, the reason I bring all that up is because the Apostle Paul speaks to us in the very same way, and I think this is something we, we need to hold on to today. If you were to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you're going to find out that Paul says the very same thing to us today about the cross of Christ. 
doesn't always make sense. And uh, if you read chapter 1 in Corinthians, here's what he says. Just watch how this applies. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved or being saved is the power of God. Doesn't look like what we would say is necessary, but it is more than what we think. And, and Paul goes on to say, it's written in verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So he's saying, if you were to take the wisest of all people, the ones that everybody will look to and say, this is the most genius intellectual mind of, of pure wisdom that any human being could ever have, God says, I'm going to make his wisdom, as great as it may look, I'm going to make it nothing. So he zeroed completely out. So then you skip down to verse number 23, and here's what he says. We preach Christ crucified. You know, to the Jew, that is a huge stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's complete foolishness. But look at verse 25 now. But here's the point. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. So here now we're playing with these, these ratios or these, these limitations. If you have a zero of wisdom, a zero of philosophical knowledge, but if someone else has a 10 out of 10 on that, then here comes God. If, if the brilliance of humanity says one thing, if God had a zero to, one, to 10, if you took the zero of God's you know, wisdom and intellect and, and philosophical you know, knowledge and power, that would still be better and stronger than the greatest that mankind has to offer. That's what Paul's saying right here. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, here's the problem of today. A lot of people wonder, how can I cast my care on someone who hung on a cross 2,000 years ago? They don't get it. Don't understand that. They, they, they sit here and, and literally uh, you know, wonder, how can I come to the cross, the way preachers are always saying? How can I really repent, confess, and be baptized into Christ? How can I put faith in Jesus for my salvation? It seems, preacher, pretty foolish to me. But the bottom line for us is, it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. That's the Jeremiah 10, 23, right? And so in all of this, what we're looking at is swallow your pride, your human greatness, swallow that, and with your footsteps of faith placed one in front of the other, obey God. And the final little tidbit on this, and that's the picture over here of these... Uh, this little crowd of people. <clears throat> you obey God no matter what the popular opinion may be. If you go over here and you're looking at Joshua chapter 6, I'm going I'm to say this right now. To their credit, it doesn't seem like, at least Joshua doesn't record any of the Jews murmuring, complaining, doubting, scoffing, all those things that we've come, come to know. But I, I wonder from a human perspective sometimes, you know, if out of maybe as many as two million people, there wasn't somebody out there mocking the idea. I don't know. But I wouldn't bring it up. That's a lot of people. I'm going to say to us today, let's obey God even when people are mocking Obey God regardless of all of the opinions. Let's make this really easy. Our society, our culture, our world today belittles and mocks the idea of the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. And we can look at that and think, wow, that would make the world a far better place when people just do that. But the world mocks that idea. You ready? Here it is. You ready? You know what's coming. Obey God anyway. You do what we know is what God wants. Do it anyway. I heard a story one time about a guy who was uh, pondering going into a mission world, a mission effort, and he was going to literally quit his you know, high-paying job and just dedicate himself to a particular area in the world and just start teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ to those people. And uh, he started getting all kinds of, of you know, all kinds of negative responses and, and people sending him letters saying, you shouldn't do this, don't do this, and they sign them. One day he got this anonymous letter, and you know how those are. The nameless letters, oh man. 
You can, you can be so bold, you know, with, with that. And, and this, this letter said, <clears throat> people are unreasonable. People are illogical. People are self-centered. You go and love them anyway. I thought that was a wonderful little motto for life. The world around us is not perfect. And people you talk to aren't, you know, perfect at all. But you love them anyway. If obedience is mocked, you obey God anyway. That leads us to our next one. These are the last two. These are going to be relatively quick. You understand that when we obey God, we're going to have an automatic victory in life? You keep God first. You keep in your priority. You walk in His steps. You're going to have some victories in life. You understand obedience leads us to victories. And when you have those victories in life, dedicate them to the Lord. Say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. That goes back to those memorial stones we talked about erecting in your own life today. Dedicate those great victories to the Lord. Look at chapter 6, verse 17. It says there, The city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it, except. Except. See, see this right here? Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Now skip down to verse 24. They burned the city and all that was in it with fire, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Obedience leads to victory. Victory leads to dedication and devotion to God. When you climb over those little humps in life, those little hurdles in life, when you go through the little dips and little valleys, you understand that, that this is saying that any time they conquered a city, there were always going to be something that was consecrated. It's basically like saying this is now set apart for a different purpose. It could be an animal, it could be gold, it could be silver, whatever the case may be. Um, why would they do that? They do that so they could recall that this victory has come from God. Now, we're looking at this. It's not them. Not them doing this. It's not them. It's Him. He's the one that gave them this victory. The biggest danger that can ever exist is that we go about, God's over here destroying walls, and we're able to walk through in this great kind of victory, and then after He's done it all, we think we're responsible for it, and we start thinking about how great we are. That's a huge problem with uh, you know, human beings today. We know why this fell. This fell because of the power of God. There's no fall without their obedience to what God commanded them. Those things are all connected right here. So obedience is the ultimate connection. It's the ultimate connector. Our faith, our obedience connect to the switch that enables us to tap into that power. The, the switch controls the power, but that power didn't come because I have the ability to flip a switch. I don't know anybody that ever says the switch is the source of power to make the lights come on in this room. That's not how it works, but it is connected to that source of power. I am not here to brag if the only thing I did was tapped into the source by flipping the switch. So that leads us to this last little point, and it's something we just saw. God in heaven never forgets the obedience. God in heaven never forgets faithfulness. So on both sides of this, I guess, if you're looking at it from a panoramic view, and there's the path God wants us to go, and I'm observing this thing, I know that my faith right here, my obedience to get this point, but then in the victories, and God not forgetting His promises, I'm watching somebody named Rahab, find salvation. She's showing her own faithfulness. She's showing her own obedience right here. If you look at verse 25, since we've already read 17 and 24, Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. And look at this. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua spent, sent to spy out the city. Here it is. God never forgets. God does not forget faithfulness. God does not forget obedience. God didn't forget what Rahab did. God doesn't forget what you're doing right now. Footsteps of faith invariably are going to lead us to some challenges. But we also know by faith what's on the other side of those walls. And when they look so big, we could never, ever, we could never, ever go. We, we. But God, God can. 
And that's the idea we want to apply today to our lives in Christ and the direction that He has called us today to go. If there's someone outside of Christ today, we would love for you to embrace Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We would love to see you go from outside of Christ, where there are no spiritual blessings, to being one with Christ by baptism into His death, contacting that blood that could purchase the Lord's church, purchase you back from a life of separating choices, and allow that sacrifice Christ made based on your faith and your obedience to place you in as part of God's called out, so that as you walk, you're walking in those footsteps that faith itself declares we, in obedience, must follow our Lord. If you are a child of God but have not allowed faith and obedience to be part of your daily walk in Christ, and you find yourself floundering at times because your focus isn't right, would love for you to get that focus back where it needs to be and make your life right today if you need to come home. Come right now as together we stand and sing. Shall veil the glowing skies Against the foe in veils below Let all our strength be hurled Faith is a victory we know That overcomes the world Faith is a victory Faith is a victory Oh, glorious victory That overcomes the world His banner over us is love Our sword, the world of God, we tread the road the saints above with shouts of triumph drawn. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still a shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. You may be seated. Just make a very quick little uh, follow-up to our Friends and Family Day on May the 5th. Um, think about this for a second. If you thought in the back of your yard at home there was a priceless treasure, would you sit around thinking about it all the time, or would you... Maybe tell someone you trusted about it. Would you sit there and sing songs of how great that treasure is? Or would you get up and dig for it? That's the idea. And of course, I'm trying to paint the picture. If you have something you know is of great value, and if you, if you really, really want it, know it's going to change your life for the best, the idea would be that you were going to, to share that. You're going to seek it 100%. Um, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, we talked a little bit about this already, that is, that is an amazing position in life. I'm a follower of Christ, and you may say, well, I'm in this branch of military service, and I'm this rank, and I'm that, and I follow this great official. Those are all great things, but when it comes down to it, certain things have an eternal, everlasting appeal. And it's only going to be found because of what God himself is able to do. So if you believe that following Jesus Christ is everything that you are, and you also believe that naturally you're going to plant seeds so that fruit is born. On May the 4th, parents, pancakes, and pajamas with our young people are going to happen on that Saturday. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could connect the, the joy and the memory of, Ch of May 4th and then allow that to connect itself with a huge Wonderful day of blessings on May the 5th. The goal of May the 5th is to have 201 people in attendance, and uh, it gives us two weeks to do that. Now, success, I think I said something like success is, is completely going to be in our laps. Truth be told, success is always because of God and his power and his love and his greatness. But I heard a prayer years ago, probably stretching back to around 98, 99, Dr. M.A. Doc Beard in East Texas 
told me something once after that prayer. He said, James, I believe, you may have heard this before, I believe we need to pray like it depends on God, but work like it depends on us. I thought that was pretty good because we understand who God is and what he desires of us. We also understand we don't just do nothing and expect great things to occur. So Friends and Family Day, May the 5th, wants you to be doing what you can right now to bring somebody with you. If it requires you to invite 100 people to get one, all that effort, I guarantee, is going to have been worth it. So be prayerful, be mindful. Next week, when we have just about a week before May 5th, I'm going to say more about this and give you some things to think about in that final week of preparation. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, James. You know, in the Old Testament, God talks about faith and obedience. And in the New Testament, Jesus says, love God and love others. Two kind of go together. To make that real to me, I have to remember two things. Number one, it's not about me. And number two, I'm not in control. And those are two things that are hard to remember some days. I usually have to wake up in the morning and, and say something like that to myself. But that does lead us to victory, and that is pretty awesome. As we close out our worship this morning, uh, we're going to pray for folks that you see listed in your worship guide there. And uh, if you would, just please join me. Father, we again thank you for today. We thank you for this day to worship you, to sing songs of praise, to participate in the Lord's Supper together. And Father, to study your word. Father, we wish for our lives to be uh, to your glory, for you to smile when you see what, what our hearts are, are aligned. And Father, we want to be aligned with you. Father, as we close out our worship this morning, we, we bring some folks to you that, uh, that are dear to us, uh, folks that uh, have requested prayer. Father, we, we bring before you Doug Camp and Jimmy Wallace as they continue to recover with their backs. Father, we pray for return of, of function. Father, we pray for relief from pain. Father, we pray for uh, Pinky Hill. And Father, we give thanks for her example and her life when we continue to lift her up to you uh, to look after and take care of her. Father, we pray for Polly Simmons and Gloria Heiler uh, Father, for uh, you meeting their needs, and, and Father, for uh, bringing the people around them that are necessary to, to comfort them and encourage them. Father, we're thankful that Renee's eye surgery has gone well, and we continue to pray for uh, full recovery for her. Father, we pray for Ruth Burris, uh, both with her heart and, and recovery as she heals her broken arm. Father, we pray for Bruce Null and Taylor Jones and Father ask that you would continue to work in their lives and meet the needs that they have and Father for Mary Ripsky as she heals her broken hip and Father as you work your daily miracle in this creation that you've made in, in knitting our bodies back together creating a body that, that will do that Father, that healing comes straight from you, and we're thankful. And Father, we pray for Bertie Gilbert as she uh, recovers um, and uh, heals from having this pacemaker placed, and pray that that will provide the uh, stability uh, for her health that she needs. Father, we're thankful that we can bring, bring our cares and our desires to you. Father, we know that you provide all healing, that you provide all everything that is good and wonderful and lovely and blessed in our lives. And Father, we give you thanks. And Father, we give you thanks that we can bear the name of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.